Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Eric Beinhacker uh, from INET uh, Oxford. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan once said that he was dying to meet a uh, one-armed economist because economists are always equivocating, saying, on the one hand, on the other hand. Um, I, I'm not a one-armed economist, but today I'm a one-legged economist due to a skiing accident. Uh, so I apologize that I'm going to give my brief remarks sitting down. Um, well, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for coming. Um, you know, this uh, sovereign debt restructuring is, is perhaps not the most glamorous topic uh, on the INET uh, agenda, but it is certainly one of the most important. Uh, history shows that countries regularly get into uh, financial trouble uh, and have difficulties with their debts, and the results are never good. Uh, according uh, to The Economist, the first uh, recorded sovereign debt default uh, was in 4 BC. Uh, appropriately enough, it was in Greece, uh, when uh, ten, 10 Greek cities failed to pay their debts uh, to the temple of Delos. Now, in more modern times, the IMF reports that between 1950 and 2010, there have been 186 debt exchanges between foreign banks and bondholders and 447 uh, bilateral debt agreements uh, 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 and restructurings with the Paris Club. So uh, there's quite a lot of this going on uh, is a key message. Now, of course, today, uh, worries about Greek debt uh, and the debt of other Eurozone countries uh, have been at the heart of the Eurozone crisis. We've also recently seen a set of uh, very dramatic court cases concerning Argentinian debt and a, a number of, of you know, countries that don't make the front pages like Jamaica uh, and others have also gone through uh, recent debt restructuring uh, issues. And we also know that the macroeconomic consequences of sovereign crises, even when there's just concern about credit quality, let alone an actual default, are often devastating. Uh, almost always leads to recession or even outright depression. Uh, and uh, 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 credit dries up in countries uh, to businesses and households. And we often see both government, consumer, and business spending uh, collapse you know, simultaneously uh, in the face uh, of these crises. And the consequences are rarely limited to the borrowing countries alone. Uh, in crises from Latin America in the 80s to Asia in the 90s, Russia in 1998, and the Eurozone today, uh, we've seen the impacts uh, quickly spread to neighboring countries and the global economy. Now, uh, given both the regularity and damage of this phenomena, one would think we had, we'd have evolved a very good mechanism for managing it and uh, dealing with the problem. Uh, almost all countries have bankruptcy uh, laws and well-developed procedures to minimize uh, economic fallout from uh, default. Yet, uh, other than the Paris Club started in the 50s, uh, we don't seem to have that much. Uh, a recent report from the IMF noted that debt restructurings have uh, usually been, quote, too little and too late, uh, and the current processes don't work well. So the big question is, what do we do? Uh, and to answer this very important question, we have a very distinguished panel. Uh, we have uh, Joe Stiglitz of Columbia University, uh, Martin Guzman, also of Columbia, and Richard Kahn of Innovate Partners. Uh, and each of our speakers is going to uh, present for about 20 minutes, uh, and then we'll have uh, plenty of time for Q&A and uh, debate afterwards. So first, starting with you, Joe. OK. Oh, uh, the Greek crisis has really uh, uh, put the issue of uh, uh, sovereign debt restructuring back on the agenda. Uh, but actually, uh, there are a couple of other things that, that have uh, been instrumental in putting the issue of debt restructuring, sovereign debt restructuring, back on the agenda. Uh, back in 2001, uh, there was the largest default up to that point, which was Argentina. And uh, it, it was a, a very exciting uh, default. Uh, the, um, at the time, uh, the, the, managing, uh, the deputy managing director of the uh, IMF proposed that we ought to have a systematic way of restructuring debt, a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, mimicking in some ways the, uh, what every country uh, has uh, within their country for resolving situations where, which happen all the time, where debtors can't pay back what they owe. So uh, this has been a problem that's been recurrent in, in 2,000 years. 
and uh, uh, the question is what to do about it. So, so the IMF proposed a, a, um, uh, that there be a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. I think there was widespread support with the international community, but as you know, uh, in the international community, not all voices uh, are of equal influence. And at the IMF, there's one voice in particular that has more influence. Uh, uh, it has the veto power, and that's called the United States, or the G1. And in this particular case, one of the minor mistakes of President Bush, not minor compared to the Iraq war or the Afghanistan <laughs> war, but still with long-lasting consequences, was his uh, effective veto of this uh, important initiative. Well, the fallout of that hasn't really gone away. Uh, the uh, Argentinian government restructured the debt, uh, I think it was in 2005, uh, in many ways, it was a very innovative restructuring that many economists were very enthusiastic about because it entailed using a new set of instruments, being used occasionally before, which are GDP-linked bonds. Um, and that was a way of restructuring. It would have been analogous to Chapter 11 in the U.S. bankruptcy law so that it gave the country more flexibility. And uh, while the market resisted, uh, it worked. And it worked in the fundamental sense that Argentina, uh, after its uh, default and its devaluation, grew, grew, I think, the second most rapid growth of any country in the world from that period to the period of the uh, next uh, Great Recession, 2008. Um, and so it, it really showed that there's life after debt, there's life after devaluation, and if you restructure your debt and do it right, you can actually grow very rapidly. Very much in contrast to a, a lot of the IMF-sponsored restructurings, where three years after a debt restructuring, you have another crisis, and then another crisis. So the history of debt restructuring is typically they are too little, too late, and uh, not as effective. And so the, the, the Argentina one was a model of, in that way, of success. but. One of the peculiar aspects of it was that there was a group of hedge funds, which you call vultures. Uh, it was interesting in the UN debate, uh, the uh, ambassador from one of the countries said, you know, that was an insult to vultures. Um, <laughs> that uh, vultures are actually an uh, important part of our ecology. They actually perform a useful social function in our ecology, but the vulture funds are unambiguously parasitic and are not a useful part of our uh, economic ecology. And the, the, but anyway, the, uh, you're getting, I'm getting ahead of the story. So, so there was a US judge who basically made a ruling that had the effect that it would make debt restructuring virtually impossible. And that would mean the whole idea of getting a fresh start, dealing with your past decks, was virtually, as I say, impossible. So uh, that, that, that decision has been very strongly criticized, both on legal terms and certainly on the economic terms. Uh, it, was, it, it brought together strange bedfellow, bedfellows, uh, even though uh, many countries were critical of what Argentina had done, Judge Grisa's decision was so bad that countries like France, uh, even for a while the U.S. Treasury, the IMF, all said to the U.S., uh, you can't let this decision stand. And they filed a brief, I filed a brief, uh, an amicus uh, brief saying that uh, that decision was not in the interest of the global economy, developing countries, or even U.S. financial markets. But the U.S. Supreme Court decided not to hear the case, and so Judge Grease's decision stands. Uh, in response to that, uh, the private sector has proposed to say that, that uh, there are some changes, and that Martin will talk a little bit about these, in the contracts that could be made that would restore the viability of the sovereign debt market. So this is a big deal uh, because it really does threaten the sovereign debt market. 
in response to this, the, at the UN, there was a uh, proposal to revisit the issue of the international legal framework. And that resolution passed overwhelmingly in September, and there is now a process to re-examine the, the, the international framework for sovereign debt restructuring. This is consistent. I was a char, a, 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 a headed a, inter, a group of international experts in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis. We anticipated that there would be some sovereign debt problems in the aftermath. They haven't been quite as bad, but we, we are having some. Um, and we said, we really need a international framework, and we called for that, and we described a little bit uh, about what was needed. And uh, this UN resolution has actually implemented that idea and is beginning a process going on at the UN. Uh, interestingly, though, the United States and a number of developed countries are opposing it. They are against creating an international rule of law. They like a system of what I would call the law of the jungle, which is where big, powerful countries twist the arms of poor countries and until they yell and then make an agreement. So the international financial communities are the view, what's wrong with the current system? Because most of the time, with a few exceptions, the countries cave in. And we like it that way. Uh, anybody who believes that, that a system of international law is designed to protect the weak and, and those who can't defend themselves say this is uh, not uh, a good system. So uh, that's where we are, and we're going to be talking about uh, the economics and uh, so, uh, wh why this is so important, what are the economics of bankruptcy uh, or debt restructuring, and what is the law, and how, what can you do to, to, uh, to deal with it. What is the controversy, and, and, and let me tell you where, clearly where I stand on this. Uh, why does the United States uh, take the view that it does, uh, and what is that view? The view, as I said, of the United States government is that you don't need an international bankruptcy procedure, uh, sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. To my mind, that's the most peculiar view that uh, a country can take. I was at the World Bank in, at the time of the East Asia crisis as chief economist, and both the World Bank and the IMF, there was unanimity. A major problem in the East Asian countries is that many of them did not have good bankruptcy laws. No one, no one ever said that a country didn't need a bankruptcy law. I never heard anybody even uh, suggest that was a possibility, that a country could do without a bankruptcy law. There was a lot of concern about bankruptcy laws that didn't work, and how to set up the right court system, but everybody agreed that there needed to be a, a, a bankruptcy law. And here, among the leaders of this view was the U.S. government. And here you now have the U.S. government say, saying, we don't need a bankruptcy law. <clears throat> well, you can figure out the political economy of this. I'm not going to go into that. But what, what my view is that if you need a bankruptcy law for domestic debt restructuring, it's even more important to have one for international. Why is that? All the issues that arise in domestic law arise internationally, but international sovereign debt restructuring has several issues that are much more complicated and that even uh, necessitate more having a, 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 a way of resolving disputes. So what are some of those things? For Domestic debt, you have a company, say a corporation, where there are well-defined assets and well-defined liabilities. And what basically bankruptcy law does is to say, what are the priority? Who gets satisfied first? It sets a framework for bargaining. And then it's important to have a judiciary because quite often it's not clear what the priorities are, what, what the assets are, who has claims. So, so you need a judiciary to dissolve disputes, 
but there it ex creates a legal framework. Most countries' legal framework, just as an aside, I can't help but say this, most legal frameworks, for instance, give first priority to workers. And that's consistent with a general theory of a rule of law to protect those who can't protect themselves. Workers have already given their labor. They can't get it back. I'm saying, sorry, can you give me back my time? <laughs> you can't do that. Time goes one way. So they are first priority. The United States is an exception to that in our bankruptcy law. First claimant are the derivatives. Those risky products, Warren Buffett called financial weapons of mass destruction, why would you do that? Well, that goes back to America's political economy. We have a government that's basically run by Wall Street. Wall Street produces derivatives, likes those derivatives to be protected, more important than workers, obviously. And so we have a, a, a bankruptcy law that gave first claim to the derivatives. Um, but put that aside, um, the, the so the difference is that for sovereigns, it's not clear what the assets are. What is the limit of taxation? It's not clear. That's a G judgment. Hard to decide. And it's not clear what are the claimants. So what weight do you put on Social Security, old age pensions? They've made contributions. They thought they had a claim. Should the foreign claimants, the foreign debtors, are they more important than the old age people, the children, uh, than, than, you know, are the formal claimants more important than the informal claimants? And if you make a distinction, it's very easy to convert informal claimants to formal claimants. And how do you wait for it? Uh, so that's one set of issues. Second set of issues uh, ha ha has to do um, with... Uh, uh, a multiple jurisdiction. This sometimes happens even within countries, and I'll come back. To, uh, the, the, in the case of, of what is going on now, illustrates uh, this case. Judge Grisa, the case of Argentina, they had bonds written under the jurisdiction of New York, but they also have bonds written under the jurisdiction of Argentina, and also under the jurisdiction of the UK and other countries. Well, Judge Grisa didn't fully grasp the complexity of international law. Uh, maybe I'm being unfair, and he's not here, but, but, uh, 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 but uh, the result was that he made a ruling which said, in effect, that you can't pay the, those who've agreed to the exchange of bonds for the restructuring of the Argentina debt back in 2005, you can't pay the interest on those until you pay all the money that you owe to the vultures, who are people who bought the bonds at a discount. So they need to get 3,000% return on their investment before you give any return to the people who've accepted a restructured bond. Now, some of you look at that and say, that's peculiar. It's certainly not in accord with any, what anybody would think is just as fair. That's true, but American law is not about justice. Maybe I'm being unfair, but uh, it, it's about, well, I won't say what it's about. Uh, Richard can, can, can talk about that. So, uh, but that was the ruling. But he didn't fully grasp, I think, or didn't, that in fact, some of these bonds don't go under US jurisdiction. So a British judge uh, ruled that some of the people with British bonds went to the British court and said, this American judge ten is ruling about our British bonds. And the British judge said, he can't do that. So now we are in legal limbo land. We have two different rulings, inconsistent, and no one knows where this is going to go. Um, so in the old days, I should have commented, we had easy ways of resolving sovereign debt restructuring problems. Uh, back uh, in those old, good old days, very simple. If a country owed money, you sent in your army or your navy. <laughs> and uh, the Western Europe and the United States had bigger armies and navies, and we usually got things settled, settled fairly quickly. And the United States thought this was a good way of doing things, 
the other countries only complained for a little while until we took over the government, and the new government usually went along with what we said after we chose them correctly. So um, uh, the, uh, one of the famous cases that led to a, uh, uh, an important doctrine I'll mention in a minute was a case of Venezuela that, didn't owe, that owed money to the European powers, and uh, they, the European powers uh, sent in uh, their Navy vessels down in, I think it was the early part of the uh, 20th century. And uh, the foreign minister of uh, um, Argentina said, uh, that's unacceptable. Uh, it, it, as a matter of international law, a matter of international principle, People who lend to sovereigns should know that you might not get repaid. And this is a doctrine called the Draghi Doctrine. Not after the more recent famous Draghi uh, that says, we'll do whatever it takes. Uh, this is the real Draghi, uh, the Argentinian foreign minister, and uh, who, who said sovereign immunity was the basic first principle of international law and that you aren't supposed to uh, bomb countries that don't pay their debt. Uh, and he gave a very reasoned uh, account of that. So, um, uh, so in my view, uh, that the US position that private contracts without a judicial process is all we need, I think, is uh, not credible, to put it mildly, that no country has proposed that as a solution. And that the problem of international are even more difficult because of the two reasons uh, that I said, and some others. Now, interestingly, within the United States, we recognize many of the principles that I've talked about. So we have in our bankruptcy court code uh, a provision that's called Chapter 9 that applies to uh, sovereigns, uh, to, to, I mean, to, to public, public, uh, public, what? Municipalities. To municipalities and other public, and, and other public units. And what it says is that, that the uh, sh stakeholders, the citizens of the country, are equal claimants. And so it provides a framework that brings in all, 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 all of these considerations for resolving. Uh, interestingly, again, a, a peculiarity in the United States, uh, this provision, Chapter 9, there was an explicit exemption for, from Chapter 9 for America's uh, colonies. And, and particularly, this is a relevant issue because America's largest colony uh, I shouldn't ask, if I were students, I'd say, who is our America's largest colony? Um, Puerto Rico. Uh, we don't call it a colony. We call it a commonwealth, uh, uh, borrowing the old British term, but it's, it's a colony. So, so our largest colony um, was exempted from Chapter 9, was carved out. Puerto Rico said, well, you know, this is a gap in our legal framework. You have to have a... a, a a chapter, you have to have a law to deal with bankruptcy. It passed a bankruptcy law, but then the US government said, you have to remember you're a colony. You don't have the right to pass your own laws. And the US court overruled the ability of our colony to put its own legal framework, but refuses to put a legal framework in so that when Puerto Rico, which is on the verge of bankruptcy, goes bankrupt, there will be no legal framework. So uh, the IMF should go in and explain to the United States government that it's important to have uh, good legal frameworks domestically, and maybe they will then learn that maybe internationally we ought to have a good legal framework as well. Well, uh, I think maybe I, uh, um, to, uh, um, uh, just to tee up what Martin uh, is, is going to say, uh, the my view is that you need an international framework, but under the current circumstances, we're not going to be able to get one. So the question is, what do we do? And so I've been proposing, and a lot of other people have been proposing, something that's halfway in between. 
a framework where you, uh, international legal framework that, 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 that recognizes some kinds of contracts are not acceptable. And then says, tries to create a soft law, a mediating process that creates international norms. So it stops short of creating an international court, because we're not likely to get it, but goes towards creating a framework which will resolve uh, these very difficult situations and enable countries uh, to get a, a, a fresh start. So what Martin is going to try to describe is why, what is the characteristics of a good framework, concerns about efficiency and equity, many dimensions of efficiency, what are the attempts within the private law framework to make a private law framework actually work? What are the key, what, are, what is a process by which we could try to make something short of a international agreement, uh, bankruptcy courts work? Um, and then uh, Richard will continue from a more legal perspective. Thank you, Joe. So, over to you, Martin. Yeah, this nice. Uh, and could we have uh, Martin's slides up, please? All right, thanks, Joe. Uh, and thanks to INET for having this panel in the, in the conference. Um, I'll pick up where Joe left, but before I want to uh, stress the importance of debt restructuring in general. And the point I want to emphasize is that uh, limited liability uh, is essential for the correct functioning of, the, uh, of an economic system in general. Um, there are circumstances in which um, the debt distress is so large that if there is no discharge of debts, the game will become a negative sum game, and the value of that sum will depend on the existing frameworks for sol solving the debt crisis and the debt problems. Um, what we have is, we, as it was described before, we have these uh, frameworks for, for corporations, for public entities, but we don't have this for sovereigns. And that is leading to a variety of ex ante and ex post inefficiencies uh, in the international lending markets. It is leading to the too little, too late uh, syndrome that was described. And this is a general problem. It's, uh, the case of Argentina is just a symptom of what's going on. But we see that there are several countries that need debt restructurings. And it takes too long until they start those processes. And when they do it, like it happened in Greece recently, uh, it's not deep enough to uh, conduce to the economic recovery of, of the country. Um, the case of Argentina illustrates part of this issue, so I, I want to give a little bit of background of what happened there. Um, so the country in the early 90s uh, did a set of economic reforms. Basically, it was a cocktail of uh, trade liberalization, financial liberalization, and privatization of public enterprises, plus uh, the imposition of a convertibility system where uh, the domestic currency was tied to the dollar. And those reforms were supposed to deliver a large increase in productivity. So the typical situation for, for an Argentinian family by those times was to you take, take a plane on, on a Thursday night or Friday night to Miami, direct flight, and you go back Sunday night with three luggages full of clothes, uh, TVs, etc. right? So it was this perception that now we can afford this. Uh, I was born there, so I, I, I grew up seeing, seeing that. Uh, we thought we were richer, uh, but we weren't. Okay, that, <laughs> that, that never happened. So uh, in 1998, uh, the country entered into a recession. It was a very long recession. The country also suffered from this too late uh, syndrome. It lasted until 2001, and by the first day of 2002, there was a massive default. As in every debt crisis, there is a part that is the debtor's fault, and another part there is also the creditor's fault. So the country was paying very high interest rates uh, since 1998 due to the high risk of default. So everyone understood that the that, that default was a possibility. And we have these uh, actors in the, in the financial landscape, the Volta funds, what they did was to 
uh, by that, some of it in November, when it was just a matter of time when the country was going to default, it was obvious that that was going to happen, and some that afterwards uh, on, on the cheap, like on average a little bit above 20 cents on the dollar. And those were 1% of the total creditors. Uh, in two rounds, 2005 and 2010, uh, the country restructured that 93% of all the creditors accepted the deal that had been proposed. So you can see that, imagine if that was uh, occurring at the domestic level with any uh, system for collective action clauses, that would have achieved a majority. The restructuring would have been over. That didn't happen in Argentina. These voter funds, this 1%, sue the country for full payment. Full payment on the principal plus full interest that included a compensation for risk plus punitives. Uh, and M Mr. Gressa, Judge Gressa in the District of New York, uh, ruled that uh, the country had to pay them in full. So that would lead to uh, a return that is 1,600%. And uh, to enforce this ruling, uh, so the ruling was under the, the, the ruling was that there's a standard contractual clause. I'll talk about it, pari passu, that is supposed to ensure fair treatment of creditors. Two equal creditors should be equally treated. Fair treatment for for uh, this judge was that the voters get 1,600 percent, and the other 93 percent of the creditors get what they agree. It was a uh, uh, a haircut of about 65%, plus uh, the returns they will get if the country grew more, because as Joe described, uh, these bonds included uh, a GDP e index clause. Uh, this makes that restructuring is impossible, uh, and it creates a variety of inefficiencies and inequities in global financial markets. Uh, it affects more the countries that are more prone to that crisis, because those are the ones that will need the restructuring. So, and it gets access to funding more difficult, in particular, for those countries. So that, that is an inefficiency, but also an inequity. Okay? And it also creates inter-creditor inequities, because creditors are not being equally treated. Now there is an incentive to uh, pursue voter funds behavior. There is a moral hazard issue <clears throat> uh, that threatens the correct functioning of uh, global financial markets. So, this is an issue, uh, the, the, the global community is recognizing this issue, and uh, there are different views on, on the table on, on how to move forward. And the policy questions that I want to address uh, in, in this talk are, first, what can we do to improve things within the existing framework, within the contractual, the private contractual approach, which is what governs how uh, the restructurings are resolved. It's large. Uh, uh, intricate negotiations between multiple creditors and a sovereign. Okay. The second question is, what are the limitations uh, of, of these solutions? To what extent these uh, proposals will solve the problems and what other problems will remain? And I, I conclude that within the contractual approach, it will never be enough uh, to, to solve the variety of problems we're, solving, we're facing that restructuring, and we need something else, which is what Joe described, uh, which is a, a statutory approach, but that seems too difficult to, to have it uh, at least in the short run. So the question will be, what can we do, and what are the principles that should guide the design of the system we, we impose? So, there are two different views on, on the table. One is the view of the financial community. It has the support of the US Treasury and the support of the IMF. Um, and it's represented by the International Capital Market Association that, just, that recently proposed uh, a set of improvements over the uh, language of contracts. Uh, these improvements have two elements. The first one is the clarification of this clause pari passu that is supposed to ensure uh, uh, fair treatment of creditors. And what the, clar what the clarification says is that pari passu is not what Judge Griesa uh, thought it was. So Judge Griesa said Argentina has to pay creditors that accepted the restructuring and voters on a rateable basis. According to this clarification, there is no obligation for sovereign to pay on the different creditors on a rateable basis. Okay. 
And the second element is the, um, is the, it provides a formula for the aggregation of the collective action clauses. So most of the, the, the only collective action clauses we have in, the, in contracts nowadays apply at the level of an individual uh, bond. And they say if there is, a, say, an X percent that accept the proposal, the restructuring is over, but all, only for that instrument. So what a possibility is that we have, say, suppose that we have 10 different cl classes of securities, and in nine, uh, the, we achieve a majority. And in, just in one, we don't. We have voters that buy, say, 26% of one uh, a, instrument, and the threshold is 75% so, for, for achieving the majority. So they could completely block the whole restructuring. So what ICMA does is to provide a formula for aggregation. We can aggregate all the different instruments, and if we achieve a super majority, then the restructuring is over. Uh, these are improvements over the old terms, uh, welcome improvements, but they still don't solve uh, all the problems we face. The first one, the obvious one, is that there are millions, it's nine, the IMF estimates 900 billions of dollars of existing debt that was written under the old terms. Uh, it doesn't seem easy at all to exchange those bonds for new bonds with the, with the new language. I mean, we could have voters opposing to, to that, if that's a, the way uh, negotiations take. But that, that's a problem that is uh, transitory. Like in, in 30 years, it will be completely solved. But it's not the only problem, and there are others. Some of them were already mentioned. Um, There is a problem of um, of how we ensure intercreditor equity, even with uh, collective action clauses that can be uh, aggregated. And these problems arise uh, in situations in which we have debt that is issued under multiple jurisdictions and in multiple <coughs> currencies. Okay. Suppose uh, Joe buys a bond under the Japanese law that says he has priority over all the other bonds. That can be, right, it's a possible contract. It's under the Japanese law, it can happen. And I buy a bond under another domestic law, say the Belgian law, Belgian law that says the same for me. I have priority. And there is a default. And not all the contracts can be fulfilled. Who has priority then? Well, it's not obvious. And that requires a negotiation. And if there is no framework for that, the way in which the negotiation is going to be resolved is by our forces for, for bargaining. Okay? And that can lead to uh, inefficiencies and, and inequities. And the same happens with when we have uh, debts in issue under multiple currencies. Suppose that we have a, a, a debt crisis now, and, the, uh, and in, during the crisis, there's also a currency crisis. The, the, the currency is depreciating. Uh, um, rapidly, and we have debts in that currency, and we need to accelerate and bring all debts today and put a value in the debts today. If, say that that currency is the peso, well, the owners of the debt in pesos will want a, um, an appreciated exchange, a, a strong exchange rate, because otherwise the value of the debt will be lower. But the owners of, the, of debts in other currencies will want to put a, a, a weaker value for, for the exchange for the peso, because that way they will get the larger size of a pie. All right? So those are complex issues that can't be solved within the, the market-based approach. Um, this system nowadays is also unbalanced. And the way the IMF bailout policies are designed, um, favors short-term creditors, and it hurts the claimants of long-term debts. Because every temporary assistance, what it does is to save the ones that are about to get paid. But if it doesn't provide the conditions for a sustained economic recovery, it decreases the expected value of claims that are supposed to be repaid in the future. Okay. 
uh, and that's a problem that the, the uh, frameworks should also address. And there are intercreditor, interdebtor coordination issues. Uh, in a world in which we have different debtors, uh, and there is imperfect information, so we, do not, we don't know what kind of debtor we are facing, every debtor we have the incentive to, to signal that it's a good debtor. And for that, we have the incentive to um, um, issue debt under jurisdictions that show a tough behavior, like nowadays the jurisdiction of New York. If everyone does that, that will lead to a suboptimal global equilibrium where debt restructuring is made very difficult, but no one has incentives to deviate because they will show that it's not a good debtor. All right? So that is a, a, a problem that requires uh, a global solution. Um, good. So these are the problems. What can we do first within the uh, contractual approach to, to address these issues? Uh, we propose uh, uh, a few measures that can be taken. Um, international institutions can be uh, um, instrumental for implementing some of them. The first one is the issue of the credit default swaps. Okay, credit default swaps uh, nowadays are distorting the incentives of debtors to uh, participate in restructuring processes. So the idea is that um, if say Argentina uh, issues debt and Richard buys Argentinian debt, if Richard buys a credit default swap, if Richard doesn't get paid by Argentina because Argentina defaults, it will get paid anyways. Okay? So if, it's, if we don't know that he has a credit default swap and he's sitting at the table, at the negotiating table, well, the, the process can take too long because he won't have uh, the right incentives for achieving um, a, a solution. What can be even worse is that he could be the person uh, deciding whether the event is classified as default or not. And that's actually something that happened recently in the, in the case of Argentina after the uh, decision of Judge Gresa. So, ISDA is the International Swaps Derivative Association had to classify the event. <clears throat> and the, the in the committee that was voting, uh, one of the members was Elliot Management, which uh, is the vulture that is suing Argentina. Okay, so you can see the, the, the uh, conflict of interest uh, here. The second is, uh, um, the reenactment of something that is called champerty that I'll describe uh, in a second. So we get here because the evolution of legal frameworks took us to this road. There are two events that we consider are, are, are key for understanding how we get to these situations. Uh, the first is the... Um, in 1976, is the Foreign Sovereign Immunity Act in the U.S. Uh, it, the same happens in 1978 in the U.K., uh, in, according to which uh, sovereigns can be uh, can be held accountable for for uh, their actions. Um, and the 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 second is this issue of champerty. Champerty was um, English common law that prohibited the purchase of debt in default with the purpose of litigating against the debtor, okay? So what the Volter fans are doing nowadays couldn't be done while Champerty was there. There was a, a case, which was the case of Peru in 1998, that was a game changer. So in Peru, the same Volter fan, Elliot, bought debt in default and sued the country. The first circuit uh, in New York ruled that champerty apply. You can't sue Peru because you bought the debt in default. But the second circuit reversed the decision, claiming that the intention of the voters was to get paid or otherwise to sue. It makes no sense because the promise was already broken. It was unreasonable to expect to be paid in full. Okay? But uh, and the fact that it's unreasonable to, 
expect, expect to be painful and you get painful means that there was unjust enrichment. It was enrichment based on something that was unreasonable to expect. And in 2004, also lobbying from the Volters, uh, Champerty was removed from the legislation for any purchase of debt above $500,000. And the uh, justification was that uh, the courts already, already ruled that Champerty didn't apply. It's just that there is no more justification than that. So variance of Champerty could be uh, included into contracts, and, and this would prevent this kind of behavior. Uh, GDP index funds, uh, it was already explained, this aligns the incentives of the creditors and the debtors because creditors get paid more if the country grows more. So that's something that would uh, allow for more sustainable recoveries and in general for more sustainable debt restructurings. Um, but I use my last three minutes to uh, describe first, well, even with all these improvements, the variety of problems I described before will not be solved. So we need uh, a framework in which these uh, inconsistent claims can be interpreted. Okay? And a framework that gives predictability on how uh, these issues are going to be solved. What are the guidelines that should uh, be followed for the creation of this framework? Well, first it must recognize the limitations of the current approach, the market-based approach, and must provide the conditions for uh, avoiding the too little, too late problem that we have nowadays. And it should also be aware of what, a, what is a minimum set of principles uh, that everyone involved would accept. Because if we propose something that uh, parties uh, uh, taking part of that don't accept, it won't, uh, it won't move forward. So going to the details, the, a, a possible framework would be the following. The sovereign would initiate the restructuring, and there will be a set of clauses that incentivize no delays on the sovereign part. That is what to correct the problems we've done nowadays. First, there should be stays for litigation. So while this restructuring is being carried on, uh, no one can uh, litigate, litigate against the sovereign. And second, there should be um, uh, lending into arrears clauses. So lending into arrears means that the creditors that are willing to lend while the restructuring is being carried over will receive priority. So that favors counter-cyclical macroeconomic policies. So the, the, the sovereign, the country receives more funding at the moment when it needs it the most. <coughs> there will be a third stage in which there can be objections by other parties. Um, uh, we can talk more about that in the questions. And the end of the process will depend on the type of mechanism. Uh, if we uh, follow a hard law approach, the creation of an international bankruptcy law, that will require that countries that adhere to, to the mechanism uh, will sacrifice sovereign immunity. Okay, so because there will be a judge that rules what, what, how these things are going to be resolved at the, at the very end. And in the current uh, state of affairs, that will lead to huge uh, geopolitical problems. Uh, who, who, who will be the judges of the International Bankruptcy Court? How would they be appointed? What interests would they represent? An alternative uh, mechanism that is the intermediate one uh, that could have more consensus is a soft law approach where an oversight commission would act as a supervisor and mediator um, it wouldn't rule over the final proposal, but it would produce statements on whether, the pro on whether this proposal and the whole process was done according to reasonable, reasonable standards. And that would legitimate the outcome, either in the sense that the sovereign did well, or in the sense that we agree that the sovereign didn't follow the, the, the uh, guidelines that we consider <laughs> as reasonable. Okay. So to conclude, uh, we have these this problems of very complicated negotiations that are leading to huge inefficiencies and inequities, and in, case, in cases to even the impossibility of doing restructurings, they give the conditions for the emergence of Volter funds that are completely, uh, they, they, they hurt the, the system. And uh, there is a space for, for improving these frameworks, both within the contractual approach uh, also in terms of the 
the way in which the IMF bailout policies are designed, and uh, going forward to the, uh, with the establishment of a soft law approach with a more active role for the quasi-judiciary. Uh, if we don't move forward with any of these things, we will still have a very negative sum game, what we have today. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Martin. Uh, one thing I immediately learned was the vultures clearly have better lawyers than anybody else. Uh, over to you, Richard. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank you, Joe, for inviting me to uh, address this uh, distinguished conference, uh, who incidentally uh, strike me as quite glamorous from the little bit I've seen so far. So I think this is an exciting topic, Eric, and we're going to uh, make it fun today which may shock you all, but there's a, I'm going to take the approach of being sure that when you leave here in the, about half an hour from now, you have a good understanding of how a restructuring framework would actually work and why it makes sense to put it in place. You'll become experts on it. So you'll forgive me if I start with the basics, but then we're going to get to a little more complex stuff as we move ahead. Um, as you gathered, our subject today is not sovereign debt restructuring, it's the creation of a framework to make sovereign debt restructuring uh, more efficient and, and more uh, effective internationally. Uh, when I refer to uh, a framework, what I'm talking about is a convention, uh, a statute, some sort of a legal regime that is adopted by some international body which would purport to uh, control how sovereign debt restructurings take place. Uh, that may be the UN, but it could be some other body that accomplishes that. Uh, I do believe and agree with my panelists that <clears throat> agreeing upon a framework that facilitates the interaction between private and public parties would be a really good thing, and I'm going to try to have you all walk out of here understanding why that would be the case. Uh, let me start by uh, breaking this into uh, uh, essentially four different subject matters we're going to cover today. Very simple. It sounds like it's complicated, but it's actually not. We're here talking first about the catalysts, why the conversation is taking place in the world now. And you've heard a bit about that today, but I'll, we're going to make it very simple. Second, what are some of the key questions that need to be addressed as we think about restructuring? What are some of the main problems? Third, we're going to talk about a proposed framework. At least you'll have my perspective on that and we can then take target practice. And finally, you're going to get concluding thoughts, give you some perspective on some different ideas that we might look at. Uh, initially, though, I want to orient everyone to what, the, what this conversation is about. We're talking about contracts. Okay, that's all sovereign debt uh, restructuring pertains to. The, the debts themselves are agreements between sovereigns and bondholders, simple contracts. Lawyers make them a little bit fancy, but it's no different than uh, whatever agreement you reach to pay someone in exchange for a loan. Uh, the significant difference, though, between what you would do and what sovereigns do is sovereigns do not post collateral. When you get a loan, you put up your house or your car. Sovereigns are taking on or are being issued essentially uh, on the basis of unsecured debt. And that's an important issue to understand because it goes to the, the fact that when there is a default or a potential default, there is no easy way of realizing uh, on your obligation if you hold this debt because you don't have a mortgage or a car that you can grab hold of and sell. Uh, it's also important to recognize that there's no mechanism in place currently that brings all the parties together just to have a conversation about how to do a restructuring. And that would include the IMF, the private parties, doesn't exist. We can talk if we have time about why the Paris Club and London Club don't do the trick, although perhaps they could be expanded, but there's no forum to even have a conversation now. So, and I also want you to realize that as Joe mentioned, there have been past efforts to try to create the framework or, or sort of framework we're talking about today, and it failed. That was one proposed by the IMF in 2003 uh, they took the lead in that and, as Joe mentioned, could not uh, marshal 
the political support to pass that. Uh, as I mentioned, I believe the reason for that is that it was far too substantive. And I will explain to you what that means. But in essence, what it comes down to is it tried to do too much. It treaded on the sovereignty of nations, including the US, and those nations were not willing to go along with it. So let's talk first about the first of the four subjects I want to cover, the catalyst, why we're here today. And you'll hear echoes of this. First of all, the history of restructuring demands that we discuss how to do this better. We referred, in, uh, our other panelists talked about the number of restructurings that have taken place. Ken Rogoff co-authored a great book uh, that basically laid out the history of, of debt defaults. And I'll just give you a small flavor for it by looking at this chart, which uh, Rogoff and his colleagues prepared, showing defaults by country over the course of a couple of hundred years. Now, when I first looked at, at his book, I was actually a little bit surprised, because I think most of us, if we were asked how many sovereign defaults have taken place in the last couple of hundred years, we would not come up with a huge number. But the number is, is really very, very large. So this is not a problem that is small. Uh, and I think what Ken also did a good job of is showing that sovereigns try not to publicize the fact that they default all the time. Pretty logical thing to do. So this is a pervasive common problem. That's the first reason why we're talking about this. The second reason is uh, because of uh, Argentina. And I do not want to spend a lot of time discussing the Argentina case. You're all not lawyers, and I just wouldn't do that to you. It's too cruel to, to have you understand all the intricacies of these various clauses that the court was ruling on. But you need to understand a couple of things in order to, uh, to have a flavor for the recommendations that I'll be making at the end of my little presentation to you. Uh, the, the bondholders in the Argentine case agreed to, some of the bondholders agreed to accept terms that were different than the terms they had initially agreed to. Those people are called exchange bondholders, right? So let's assume that it's everybody in this room except for Mark in the silver tie over there. You see, I'm going to call you on it. It's Mark's birthday, by the way. Happy birthday, Mark. So every, everybody in this room has agreed that Argentina cannot service its debt. It doesn't make sense to pretend they can. So let's give them an extra few years to pay off the debt, maybe adjust the interest rate. Let's be reasonable. And everybody says, fine. So you take your bonds, your new bonds, which have these new terms in them, and you're sitting pretty. You've resolved the problem, except for Mark, who, who basically said, you know, I bought my bonds at, uh, for different reasons than you all did or at different times, and I'm not willing to agree to these terms. Uh, that you, it could be that, that uh, Mark is a vulture, to use that term. All a vulture me, means to me is that we're making a judgment that, that he's buying at such a discount that it seems a bit unfair. But ultimately, the secondary markets have to work. If people want to buy and sell, that's contract law. And, and you can do it. Now, some people may disagree, but I, I don't have a problem with contract law working as, as anybody wishes. So if there's a willing buyer and seller, that takes place. Or Mark may have purchased the bonds at a higher price. But the point is, he didn't agree to take these new bonds on worse terms. Now, there is, that, that, that's called being a holdout. That's what Mark would be in that situation. What a CAC clause is, a collective action clause uh, that you've heard mentioned today, is also a very, very simple concept. If all of you in this room vote to accept the new terms, that binds Mark. If there's a collective action clause, basically saying we, can, we have a supermajority, and if 80%, 90% of all the bondholders get together, we don't have to worry about Mark being unreasonable in this situation. Not that you would be, Mark. So, CAC clauses, unfortunately, 
do not exist in all the documents. And in the Argentine case, they did not exist. And so what took place was very, very simple. The judges, and it was not just Judge Griesa, it was also the Second Circuit, you know, which is a pretty decent court uh, in New York, uh, as well as the Supreme Court of the US, took a pretty simple view. Uh, people can disagree with their interpretation, of course, but they were just reading the contract, simple contract case under the relevant laws that they were applying. And they simply said to themselves, fine, the exchange bondholders made their decision, but Mark and the other holdouts have contract rights as well, and there's no collect collective action clause that binds them. Therefore, they are free to exercise their rights under the contract. Sorry. And the reason, as Joe said, and he's absolutely right on this, the reason this decision is so critical is because think of what that does with respect to not contract negotiations in the future. If I come into you as Greece and I say, everybody here, I would like you to agree with me on a restructuring. We don't have any collective action clause in our documents, and I'd like you to accept these new bonds. The first thing your lawyers are going to say to you is, watch out, because if you accept these new bonds and take, say, 50 cents on the dollar, anybody holding out can screw up your deal by basically saying to you, fine, congratulations, you get 50 cents, I still get 100 cents on the dollar, or perhaps more, because there's interest on top of that. So it creates a dynamic, legally, where negotiation to, uh, to exchange bonds becomes unfeasible if you do not have the collection action, uh, action, uh, action clauses in your contracts. And as was pointed out as well by Martin, there are in the marketplace now tons of these old bonds, and they're going to be with us for a very long time. So one of the reasons we have to talk about a framework to resolve issues is that we now have a negotiating posture created by the, the Argentine case that puts bondholders in a position where they cannot feel comfortable doing a, a reasonable deal, as long as we're dealing still with these old bonds. So I hope that that's clear. So what you take away is what holdouts are and how that affects the dynamic of the negotiation. That's the second reason why we're talking today. The third reason, which I'll be very brief on, is the UN vote. We've all been asked to talk about this. The UN, uh, uh, you know, basically every country except the, the usual suspects, the, 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 the big ones. Uh, and you know, the US has, what, 16% vote in, in uh, the IMF and, uh, and, and obviously has a veto, and as do several other countries that would be opposed to this. Uh, the UN wants us to proceed, and all I would say is uh, that we have to think carefully as we proceed in light of the UN's request about what has happened historically and how that affects a solution moving forward, and I'm going to spend a few minutes on that. Let's talk about the key questions that I want you to keep in mind as we talk through some solutions. One is, should there be a private versus statutory framework or some hybrid solution? That sounds really complicated, but it's so simple. Private simply means let's have the lawyers who negotiate these contracts, these bonds, let's have them just change the language in the bonds to put in collective action clauses and solve the problem. Okay? That's one argument that's out there in the market. Let the marketplace simply take care of it. The second issue, the second uh, approach is, no, let's not do that. Instead, we'd prefer to have a statutory framework. You know, this, this concept we're discussing today, which binds everyone in the world who has a sovereign debt restructuring issue to do it our way, the way that has been approved by some international body. And the hybrid approach, which is more where I would come out, as I'll explain, would do a little bit of both. Of course, the market's going to react to the Argentine decision. It's already happened. You know, good lawyers are out there rewriting the bonds. You know, and, well, they've already done a lot of it, and they'll continue to do it uh, now that they figured out that their documents didn't work. Um, although they, and by the way, I want to make a, a, one point. It's very easy for them to say that the judges got it wrong. That would be your position if your client ended up getting burned 
you would not say that I, I didn't draft the documents correctly. So uh, uh, there, is, there is that element. Uh, how would a framework affect sovereignty? That's the third issue I want you to have in your mind. This sovereignty flavor runs throughout this issue of how we set up a framework. Uh, why would the US and the UK support a framework? Joe's comments play neatly into this. The U I, I mentioned the US and the UK because those are the jurisdictions that are utilized far more frequently than any other in the bond documentation. So there's a vested interest, if you will, in those countries in wanting to have their jurisdictions remain the go-to places to have matters resolved and to have their laws applied. Uh, so, and then also they're very powerful countries and many others would fit on that list as well. And they will ask themselves, why would we cede authority to some international body when right now we can make the decisions ourselves? And if we're going to get a framework passed, we have to answer that question. Would the framework be perceived as fair? This is one of my absolute favorites because I, I think it's easy to forget that fairness is, is the central aspect of any dispute resolution mechanism. So if we're going to have a framework that's put in place that purports to resolve international disputes uh, am among uh, debtor nations as well as creditors from different countries, it has to be perceived as fair. And I want to give a moment of history to give you a flavor of what I'm talking about. Because you might say, of course it's fair. You know, we're all fair people. If the French, US, British all get together, it's going to be great. Well, that is not the perspective of some parts of the world. Uh, China, for example, uh, after long complaining that the IMF, the World Bank, and Asian Development Bank uh, were dominated by the interests of the US, Europe, and Japan, established the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank with the support of many nations. Uh, the IMF, England, said, fine, we'll work with them. Uh, the US has basically said, no, thank you. We're not going to do that. Then there is the New Development Bank, which Joe knows a great deal about, which was very recently formed by the BRICS, where the S on the BRICS is South Africa. And this was expressly designed to counter the unfairness perceived by many, many nations, including these five, uh, the, BRICS, the BRICS nations, uh, in, the, in the unfairness and the governance of the IMF and the World Bank. So I mentioned these examples to remind us that we have to be extremely cautious as we design a framework to make it fair. And I'll add one little side note. Even in the United States, which, by the way, has the worst legal system in the world, except for all the others, uh, we, we started with, uh, and our founding fathers had the concept of diversity jurisdiction. I don't know if there are any lawyers in here, but diversity jurisdiction is basically a, a, a concept that allows people from different states in the United States to go to uh, a federal court if they have a dispute with someone from a different state. And you might say, well, who needs that? Well, it's all about fairness. In, at the beginning of our country's history, people from different states did not trust each other. And going into the home court of another state, uh, of a litigant, would be, by its very nature, unfair. So, and, and this has, by the way, not ended. If you follow the Pennzoil case in Texaco, if you want to have a really great time as a litigant, go down to Texas and see what happens to you. So, uh, I want you all to be thinking about trust uh, when you think of what a framework should be. So the, the, the last element before I get into uh, talking about the actual proposed framework is I would like you to think in terms of the, uh, the feasibility politically of any framework that we come up with. That was my starting point in coming up with some ideas to present to you today. I, I would love to be able to come and say to you, gee, uh, bankruptcy law will, will solve all of our problems. We've got great examples in UK, US, France, everything else. But if we don't start with the political realities of what would be accepted in the international community, then I, I don't see how we actually make progress. And uh, so I share some of the pessimism that Joe has that doing too much will be extremely difficult to accomplish. 
That's why the focus of what I will be proposing to you, and again, I want to keep it simple, it will be on procedures and it will be consensual. That's the framework, those are the concepts that you're going to see in the framework that I run through now. There's another huge benefit to sticking with consensual and with procedural concepts in a framework. And that is simply this, that the less substantive the law is, the, the lower the level of concern of powerful nations in, in supporting a framework. The more power that a framework has, that we all want to give it, the greater the sensitivity, the greater the prospect of our stepping into the minefield of the, uh, the political environment in these different nations. So let's talk now about the proposed framework itself. First, we have to identify the problems we can solve in the framework and which ones we cannot. Uh, second, I want to identify the weaknesses of the status quo. And third, I want to talk about the actual framework that emerges from one and two. Now, the way I want you to think of this, and I used to be a practicing lawyer, so I can't help but do this, I want to make a case for why we have to have a framework. And I want to make a case to those people and those governments that don't necessarily see it the way we do. So we, we have to start with the building blocks. So if we identify the problems we can solve and those we cannot, let's start with the ones we think we can solve, which may seem to you small, but they're actually pretty important. We can address the coordination of restructurings, the speed of restructurings, the efficiency of restructurings, and the process and predictability of restructurings. I also don't want to spend a minute, or actually more than a minute, on the things we cannot solve in, in restructuring. And this, this is, of course, my perspective on it. I think it's critical to take on what is solvable here and to slice off and recognize that sovereign, uh, sovereign debt restructuring involves complex issues that a framework, a legal framework for restructuring is not going to be able to get into and resolve. And I think you'll hopefully agree with me when you hear what they are. Uh, the first one is moral hazard. This is a big problem that countries have, if you will, an incentive to take on more debt than they can, ser than they can service. It may be politically advisable for a populist candidate to stand up and say, I'm going to bring you all sorts of money. Uh, in any event, it, it, it's not something we can solve. The second thing is we're not going to be able to solve the political dimension to sovereign debt restructuring. And I have a long story to tell you, which also involves Greece, not to beat up on Greece, but it runs through their history with the Ottoman Empire, the ships coming into Piraeus, the first king coming on a, on a, on a, a British ship, you know, a, a German king, trying to deal with restructuring. And ironically, the issues they were dealing with in those days had to do with periphery versus the, cent the center, had to do with Russia, and the leverage that the, that the Greeks were, were utilizing at that time, the same sort of issues. But the bottom line that I want to get across to you all in terms of why politics is never going to be resolvable in a court is that our decision makers, our pol politicians, are not going to give up power to utilize the sovereign debt restructuring process to achieve their political aims. The results in Greece right now will affect the Eurozone, the EU itself, the relationships uh, that we have with Russia, certainly the resolution of Ukraine. And Greek, the, the Greek politicians apparently know this because the first phone call that Tsipras made after being elected was essentially to Putin, right, setting up that dynamic. This is an old story. So we are not going to get that out, and we're not going to get the IMF out of the picture either in terms of their own responsibilities to move forward uh, with, with their goals. So let's talk about what the framework can actually be. Uh, sorry, uh, let me move ahead because I'm running out of time. One, it, it, in my view, it must be consensual. And you might say, gee, that's not much if it's consensual. Well, the International Court of Justice is consensual, and virtually every international organization that functions now is consensual. In other words, countries have to agree to be part of it. So we have to make it attractive. 
has to be open to all relevant parties, including the IMF. The rules and procedures uh, for restructuring have to be set out. Uh, and this is not a small thing. The bankruptcy laws in all of our countries are primarily procedural. Very little substantive law in there. Next, substantive law would be applied only with the consent of the parties, either because their contracts have it in their, their clauses, that they pick New York law, and they've also agreed to have this forum resolve it, or because as they negotiate, they realize, this is, this is very common, that they want to have someone give them a decision on some issue. It would be made up of impartial, independent expert, uh, sovereign debt restructuring facilitators, which I'm also calling decision makers only to the extent that the parties consent. So it's a forum where people can get expert input and where they can all meet. It has to facilitate addressing contagion, sustainability, and debt. This is a point I, I neglected to mention in terms of why we have to come up with a solution and why the contractual approach does not work, so forgive me for backtracking, but this is a crucial issue. The reason why it is not enough just to change contract terms is because the parties to contracts do not think about and are not responsible for systemic threats. They are not responsible for the effects of their contracts on our system overall or the contagion of, of it spreading to another country. That's why there has to be some sort of a regulatory aspect in order to deal with it. So this, this type of a framework facilitates people discussing that. The creditors committee is possible. It's all about procedures and we ultimately need to get the support of the private markets. I would love to spend time on why setting up an international bankruptcy court would not, in my view, work right now, and I've got a lot of reasons for it, but I will limit myself to saying that the moment you get into substance, trying, trying to tell the judges what their job is, you know, is it to get uh, help the country that's subject to the restructuring? Is it to get the bondholders paid? Is it to protect the system against defaults in other countries? Courts have to have that in mind in order to make their decisions. There are innumerable issues that are highly politicized and highly complex that would have to be decided to create an actual substantive bankruptcy law. I think we could get there, but what I'm proposing is that these tracks go in parallel. The first thing to do is get the procedures in place, get a forum up, and simultaneously let's work on some type of a consensual code and see if we can slowly get some power into that, uh, into that new tribunal. Before I run out of time, I very much want to talk about uh, a subject that is not fair for us to discuss today because it has, in my view, nothing technically to do, oh, I shouldn't show that yet, with, <laughs> the, uh, 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 with the subject of sovereign debt restructuring. Sovereign debt restructuring by its very nature is about the back end. You've got contracts in place, they're being breached, and now we've got to figure out what to do about it at the end. And that's what the, the framework is about, how to resolve the disputes at the end. I believe that the logical place to start, particularly to deal with systemic risk, contagion, and those types of issues, is on the front end. If the UN is asking us to come up with a solution to sovereign debt restructuring, what we ought to be thinking about is where can we build consensus in the international community so that the parties to contracts are not able in their contracts to create systemic risk. So the way to think of it is, just as in, our, in the US we had this minor problem of too big to fail that crashed the entire world economy, that problem arose because we did not have regulation. We had private party, or sufficient regulation. We had private parties doing what they wanted, and we did not have the controls in place to stop it. So what would that amount to in the sovereign debt context, and where could we get consensus? Well, let's start with the simplest one that I mentioned at the beginning, as we were talking about collective action clauses. If we could have, say, uh, the UN reach consensus that all future sovereign debt instruments must have collective action clauses in them, or that they may also be required to have standstill clauses, which basically are clauses allowing people time to negotiate once a, a default starts to be, uh, to be imminent. Those types of clauses in the agreements would actually stop sovereigns from competing for debt 
on the basis of creating danger, essentially, to the international community. A way to think of it is, the way things are set up right now, and I think it was your phrase when we talked about it at dinner, it, there's a race to the bottom right now. That race to the bottom is to get debt on whatever terms are possible, and if it happens to put the international system at risk, so be it. And then we get all these bailouts and all these problems coming up. The final thing I want to say is we need to build consensus. And that means talking through these issues, but it also means holding conferences like this and the, uh, the last one that we just had, which was a, a retreat, a nature retreat where we all went canoeing. And there's a picture of Joe and others here as we were trying to deal with sovereign debt restructuring problems. Uh, Joe was yelling at us to paddle harder uh, and also pointed out the most important lesson, which is that uh, we all have to start paddling much, much, much earlier. And uh, what we're all trying to say today is that that can make all the difference. So thank you. <clears throat> now, um, I'm afraid we're running, uh, we've run over and are running very close to the end of the time. So we'll only have time for a, a, a few, uh, and I would emphasize brief questions. So I'm gonna take a batch of questions let's say, you know, three or four, and then I'll give each panelist, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a minute or so to respond to the questions. So, um, uh, gentlemen there in the, in the yellow tie. Thank you very much for the great presentations. Um, how, how do you deal with uh, enforcement law? Uh, even so complicated to create the, the framework, but once the framework is created, how the international uh, law can make uh, the parties or the country to do what they is, is, is being decided. Thank you. Mark? I'd really like to hear, uh, Joe, uh, I'd really like to hear your most um, charitable rationale for why the United States might oppose the, uh, the creation of a, that international legal framework, or maybe, you know, maybe put it better. Um, make the best case if you, as a lawyer for, for what that is. And I just want, you know, just so that we can understand what the issues are. Thank you. Others, maybe this side of the room? Anyone else? Well, you're a very quiet group. Right, uh, so how do we enforce this and how do we get uh, the U.S. to play ball? I guess the first question is, how do you enforce my talking briefly? Uh, so, uh, uh, to answer your, your question, uh, I don't know if you know uh, uh, a person who was the deputy head of the National Security Council under Obama uh, is a woman called Nancy Sonderberg. She left and became the chief lobbyist for the vultures. So if you want to know the simple explanation, I would say that's the most cogent explanation. It is pure corruption on the part of the, uh, in the U.S. But what argument did they give? I think I don't think I've hear, heard any coherent argument. What I hear from the financial community, and I do, you, you do, they say the system is working. Don't fix anything broken. They said this in 2003 when they put in the collective action clause, case by case. It didn't work. Ten years later, the system broke down. Now, they're saying it again, and what they mean, my interpretation, a little bit uncharitable, no, it's not, um, is what they do is they twist the arm of every country until it says, we give up, and they say, that's fine. Uh, and the real complaint is Argentina didn't give up, and so Argentina is the bad actor. It's sort of like... They say, you know, it was, it was like those who were uh, um, the slave owners in the south of America, in the south of the United States, were sa uh, said, you know, our legal system works. Most of the slaves don't run away. Uh, and uh, therefore, what, what are you complaining about? Anyway, uh, that's a little bit, uh, I, I think it, it, there is no, no economic argument. I want to make one, one uh, comment about the moral hazard point. That, Richard made, because that's really a, uh, an important issue. I believe that there is a very connect, close connection between the back end and the front end. Uh, and that is to say, uh, there's a lot, uh, particularly in the financial community, there's often a view that the main objective 
of bankruptcy law is to maximize the flow of funds to develop, developing countries. And then once they get in, in hock, to maximize the returns they can get out of them. Uh, my mind is the real objective here is to get the efficient amount of lending and borrowing, and that uh, there is a real political economy problem that a government today has an incentive to borrow knowing that some other government is going to have to repay, and they get to spend the money. The banks, the financial lenders, know this too, so they have an incentive to bribe the current government to borrow and say, oh, don't worry about it, because in the future you're going to be richer. Of course, that's not true. And, and so I think there's a real political economy problem. And that's why fixing the back end creates better incentives, recognizing that you won't get repaid. Then the incentives of the banks to try to induce bad borrowing is reduced. Now, we're, we're, we're really out of time, so any just final, very brief comments from Martin and Richard? Uh, yeah, just one quick comment. I, I want to comment on the uh, interpretation of contracts. Uh, and the point is that uh, how do we define default? How do we say that uh, a contract was not fulfilled? If a country is paying uh, an interest rate that includes a risk premium, it means that we know that there are states in the, of the world in which debts can't be repaid. So then if a judge says the contract said that the country was going to pay this and there's no possibility that the country doesn't, that seems like a very narrow interpretation of contracts uh, that is not consistent with the economics behind it. Thanks. Richard? I'll, I'll respond to the one question I don't think we directly answered yet, which is uh, what about enforcement? And my response is uh, I don't think it's, it, the early stages of a framework, there will be any compulsory enforcement. I think it, that's what I meant by consensual. Uh, I think the reality is, whether we like it or not, that the only way this is going to get started and we're going to get people in a room talking about it is for it to be consensual and for the politicians to feel that there is no risk of ceding power uh, without understanding exactly what they're getting into. And I would also make the point, no lawyer in his right mind is going to have his client sign some agreement that gives power to a new international tribunal that has no precedent and no clear, uh, no clear basis to function. Uh, that's just not going to happen. It's going to have to start by having an agreement to apply US law, UK law, something with precedent. And that's going to be an extremely complicated process. So I think the answer is it won't be enforcement at first. It'll be consensual. Other than the, the pressures of, of getting along with the system, right. Thank you. Well, uh, it just uh, leaves it to me to um, thank our distinguished panelists and thank all of you for participating.